please join me in welcoming Henry Kissinger and Steve Orleans. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you, Bill. Now, is my mic on? Can people hear me? Thank you, Bill, and thanks to our friends here at, uh, at Citigroup for providing this lovely venue. Uh, let me just, two things. One, I see flashes going off. Please, no flash photography uh, while we're doing this to, pre to preserve our fading eyesight. And uh, second, uh, please shut off your cell phones and Blackberries and other things. Since we're recording this, it will interfere with the recording. Uh, but as Bill said, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, you know, not only Nobel Prize winner and, and um, Secretary of National Security Advisor, but most recently a guest on the Colbert Report. <laughs> Which, by the way, those of you who want to have some fun, go online and it's quite, a, uh, it's quite an interview. I have to say, I, we won't nearly be as funny, but we will certainly be more substantive. I think it's fair to say that over the last half century, no American has contributed more to um, U.S.-China relations than you have, Secretary Kissinger. So it's really, it's wonderful that you, you've written this book. And it's really, for those of you who haven't read it yet, it's really a terrific, terrific book. Um, and it's unusual, for me at least. Most books I think are terrific, kind of never make it into the public eye, since my taste is a little <coughs> off center. But this book has really already been on the New York Times bestseller list for seven weeks in the top 15. And um, I noticed today, and maybe you can explain this, that it's number one on the bestseller list in India, which is, which is, uh, which is quite something. And um, I got back from Beijing on Saturday night. Uh, I spent the last three weeks there. And I think it's fair to say that virtually every conversation that I had, people talked about the book. And this was from Dai Bing Guo to Yang Jiechi to Wang Qi San. They all were, were talking about the book. And I think it's fair to conclude that this book is going to become a textbook for those that are, that are studying uh, US-China relations. My first question that relates to actually my time in China. Um, the Chinese obviously view you as, you know, you were the single most admired American by the Chinese. Um, and those who read English have read the book. Those who don't read English are waiting for the translation. So my question, I understand uh, the press reports, you've signed a, um, a contract with Citic Books to publish this in Chinese. So my question is, will it be published? Will there be deletions? What are the Chinese saying to you about the book? Uh, I, uh, I have a policy everywhere that I don't agree to abridgment of, uh, of my writings. And uh, anybody who signs a contract with me, understands that. Uh, what the Chinese uh, decision will be, uh, I, I have taken the view in China that this is a book written for non-Chinese to understand China. It's up to the Chinese to decide what is uh, uh, but I, I have been told that a Chinese translation uh, will appear, and I have no reason uh, to question that. Do you expect it to be published in full? My there is a Chinese translation, but it's, it's, it's for sale in Hong Kong and Taiwan. My position on translations is that I do not agree to uh, no... Uh, no uh, uh, condensed version is authorized by me. Good. The, um, another issue that was kind of um, part of my conversations in China was uh, this John Zeming and his health. You, in your book, 
show yourself to be a tremendous admirer of John Bonet, felt he did a spectacular job. Whether, we don't know what the status of his health is, but he seems that in the not too distant future he will be passing from the scenes. What do you think the implications are of his passing for China and potentially for U.S.-China relations? Well, I uh, have great respect for Chiang Zemin uh, as a statesman, and I have enormous regard for him as a person. Uh, he took over the uh, principal position in China as General Secretary of, uh, of the party in 1989 after the <coughs> events in Tiananmen Square. And uh, it was a moment when China was uh, uh, in conflict with many other countries uh, who had a different view of these uh, uh, of these events? So China was somewhat uh, isolated. Uh, the Deng reforms had not yet been implemented; they had started, but the full effect of the Deng reforms uh, was uh, was not yet felt. And so Chiang Zemin took over after a period of tremendous internal. Uh, difficulty and at a moment of complicated international uh, situation. Uh, there were sanctions uh, against China uh, from, uh, from many countries. Uh, there were no senior representatives of the United States in China. So out of this situation, over a period of 12 years that he was in office, uh, uh, Chiang Zemin contributed to the restoration of relations with the United States and other democratic countries. He led the uh, admission of China into uh, the WTO. The modern China that we see was in many ways conceived by Deng but executed uh, uh, by uh, Chiang Zemin. And so at the end of his period in office, he left with uh, a widely held respect. Uh, at the end of his period, he came up with a doctrine called the Three Represents, which opened the Communist Party to membership at, uh, into uh, aspects uh, of the society that had been uh, part before. So it was a broadening of the base of, uh, of Chinese leadership. Uh, so uh, uh, it, would, it would mark the end of an important period in Chinese history. It has been said that after leaving office because of the prestige in which he was held and the connections that he had built that he retained an influence in Chinese uh, public life, I do not think that his passing will fundamentally affect any of the di directions that have been set by Hu Jintao and by the uh, people that succeed him. But uh, I would imagine that he will be remembered uh, with considerable respect and I certainly think of him with considerable respect. Uh, I, I don't think it will have a, it may have some impact on the discussions that are undoubtedly going on about who will be succeeding in the changes that are taking place. But uh, Chiang Zemin has the made the significant role he performed was while he was in office. Can we talk about Taiwan for a second? The um, brilliance of the Shanghai communique and the, um, I think in the book you said, you know, over these 40 years, neither the US or China have allowed the issue of Taiwan to interrupt the momentum of their relationship. And yet later you say that the ambiguity cannot continue forever. The question 
I guess as I have, you know, it's the, the situation across the streets is now fundamentally different from the day that the, you know, you engineered the Shanghai communique. U.S. policy has remained fundamentally the same. Is it time for the U.S. to take a more activist role in promoting a peace agreement between Taiwan and the mainland? In other words, not reunification, not independence, but just a peace agreement which basically says, you know, consistent with what Hu Jintao and, and Ma Ying Zhou have been saying, which is basically the, the you know, the three no's. No, no reunification, no independence, no force. And that would allow for a much broader political and security agreement between the mainland and Taiwan, which would ultimately approve, improve U.S.-China relations. Well, when I first went to uh, uh, Beijing, I was the emissary to a capital that we did not recognize as the capital of the country. At that time, Taipei was, was recognized by the United States as representing uh, uh, the capital of China. We still had military forces in, uh, in Taiwan, and there had been 136 uh, meetings between Chinese and American diplomats on this subject and they had never been able to agree on an agenda because uh, China demanded the recognition of the principle of one China and we uh, demanded uh, a uh, acceptance of, of uh, peaceful, uh, a peaceful uh, uh, change. And uh, so we, uh, both sides had to had to navigate, uh, uh, we found a formula for the recognition of one China, which said that both Taiwan and the main and uh, the PRC were asserting that there was only one China, because that was the official position of both sides, and that the United States did not challenge uh, that proposition. Uh, China gave us no assurance, no, did not accept the peaceful unification uh, proposition in principle, but Chairman Mao on a number of occasions uh, made clear that there was no time urgency, and he mentioned uh, that we take, uh, could wait a hundred years. Uh, so this is, this uh, is how the process uh, has evolved. I do not uh, agree that there has been uh, uh, no evolution. Uh, President Bush uh, said uh, uh, not only that the United the Shanghai community has said the United States does not challenge the view of the Chinese. Uh, uh, President Bush stated that uh, uh, the United States supports a one China solution, uh, not just as my challenge. Uh, I would say that there are three principles that have been on the have been underlying that uh, issue. Uh, one, uh, the one China uh, principle. Secondly, the United States. dedication to a peaceful solution. And third, the United States uh, urging everyone, including itself, to take no steps that would unsettle uh, the, uh, the situation. Uh, it, uh, uh, so this is where the situation is today. Uh, it is, we, the hope of, uh, of all of us who are concerned with this issue is that the evolution in both uh, Beijing and Taiwan will permit a negotiation between the parties which will bring about a uh, peaceful uh, solution and that it, 
evolves without the threat of force or other or, or other pressures. Of course, circumstances will change, and it is not a status quo that will remain uh, uh, forever. But uh, those of us who've been engaged in the policy have hoped that the issue would be resolved by negotiation between the Chinese party and not by an attempt by the United States to settle the issue on behalf of the Chinese party. So you basically are saying that U.S. policy as it stands is... I think the principles are valid, uh, but they have to be, as they have already in the past, be considered in the light of circumstances that, uh, that uh, and the evolution of both Chinese, of both of these uh, societies. Because what I'm suggesting is actually taking it one step further and having the U.S. government actively support a peace agreement between the mainland and Taiwan. Now, the United States supports a peaceful solution between right, the two. Right, going beyond that. Uh, I, uh, I did not address that issue in the book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, let's talk about Vietnam then, since that's been in the news a lot this weekend and there's probably no, um, there's no American who's had more experience negotiating with the uh, Vietnam government. You have this, um, wonderful quote, which is, Vietnam's almost maniacal nationalism drives other societies to lose their sense of proportion. And you say that in the context of uh, the 1979 uh, war between Vietnam and China. Uh, this weekend, the U.S. held joint naval exercises with Vietnam, and the U.S. claimed that this is unrelated to the disputes in the South China Sea, and these were long scheduled um, exercises. Um, I find that claim um, not very convincing. <laughs> you argue for kind of building strategic trust between the United States and China. So my question is, by doing this, by doing this at this time, are we just furthering the mistrust between the U.S. and China? Um, how should we be treating this disputed territory dis uh, issue between China, the Philippines, Vietnam, and four other countries? Well, uh, I think, uh, uh, well, I can't recite this book by heart, so I don't know whether the quotations are exactly, uh, whether I applied this to every country uh, that deals with Vietnam. But it's certainly true that in my experience during the Vietnam War, uh, negotiating with the uh, Vietnamese, uh, uh, they uh, sustained themselves in very uh, difficult situation by an almost obsessive uh, uh, concern with their own problems and an almost total inability to regard the views of, uh, of any other uh, society. So uh, that was certainly true in my ex experience uh, uh, a vision. Uh, I uh, I entered the negotiation with the illusion that a compromise was possible, but it, in fact, what for the Vietnamese a compromise was the same as a defeat. So that uh, I, it was a very very difficult uh, uh, negotiation. Uh, now. Uh, the relationship between Vietnam and China has a long uh, history. Vietnam is the 
only country that was under Chinese sovereignty that uh, wound up establishing a state independent of China, and while somewhat influenced by Chinese culture, uh, never was fully in the uh, Chinese uh, orbit. So Vietnamese nationalism has a historic basis of being contrary to uh, 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 to Chinese uh, to Chinese nationalism, and the Vietnam War was barely over in 1975 uh, when uh, the Vietnamese, in effect, expelled the entire Chinese population from uh, from Vietnam, and within two years of the uh, end of the. Uh, uh, of the Vietnam War in which China had uh, significantly assisted Vietnam. Uh, China, uh, Vietnam had engaged in, uh, uh, in, in, in furthering ties with the Soviet Union, which finally culminated in 1978 in a, a Chinese uh, uh, in a, a Vietnamese-Soviet military agreement. Uh, the Chinese were very concerned at the time with Vietnamese uh, invasion of Cambodia and the Vietnamese domination of Laos, which therefore created the risk of a major, of a major state on its southern border, which had conflicting uh, national interests. So therefore, what uh, the relationship between America and Vietnam uh, is of special sensitivity uh, in uh, in Hanoi, in uh, Beijing. Uh, I would therefore, it's uh, uh, and one has to consider this uh, not only in the abstract but in, uh, in, in any concrete circumstances. Uh, I was uh, naval exercises between Vietnam and the United States are bound to be considered as uh, f fundamentally affecting an ongoing, uh, uh, an on ongoing dispute. And therefore, in my view, should be done with great caution uh, on uh, on the American side. On, with respect to the South China Sea issue, there are three problems. One is the uh, uh, navigation, the freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. The second are the territorial disputes between China and a whole host of uh, countries, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, which arise out of overlapping definitions of uh, the economic zone. The economic zone being a 200 mile radius uh, from uh, national borders uh, which in which countries have sovereign economic, but not other rights. There's some dispute between the United States and China on the definition of economic zone, because China treats it almost like a territory, you see. At any rate, the issue arises because if you draw 200 mile boundaries uh, across every around every island, and if you, uh, uh, and if the Chinese claim for every island uh, is sustained, it has the practical effect of closing the South China Sea. So, uh, and the third issue is, what is the relationship of China and the United States in, uh, in, uh, in South Asia? I think for the immediate issue, it is important to separate the freedom of navigation from the territorial issue and to establish 
the fact that China and the United States uh, recognize freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, regardless of how the territorial issue will be set. Uh, secondly, on the territorial issue, uh, the major United States interest is a peaceful outcome uh, uh, based on the principle that issues of this nature, if they are settled peacefully, lead to a stable international environment altogether. And then the third issue is how, how do the United States and China interact in South uh, East Asia. And uh, there are two ways one can uh, look at it. One can say this is a contest of who dominates the region. So it's either Chinese dominated or American dominated. But one could also take the position or the aspiration that China and the United States should have prime, uh, basically cooperative relationship so that they are not contesting who dominates the area and that China has its right to uh, friendly relations in the region, but so do we. And we have, and on this basis, if we don't deal with, so I would not, I think we should move the, the Southeast Asia issue from a strategic military issue to an issue of, uh, in which cooperation between China and the United States on the one hand, and China and ASEAN countries on the other, become part of a <coughs> mutually accepted international system. Do you think the Chinese became more aggressive on this issue two years ago? As part of the, after the financial crisis, there's a, a narrative that um, they perceive that there, there was a perception of the West as in decline and Chinese policy, whether it was in the Senkakus towards Japan, um, the East China Sea with respect to North Korea or the South China Sea, that they just took on a more aggressive posture. And that's a narrative that seems to have led to our taking um, a lot of these steps with the Vietnamese. But I'm <coughs> Uh, I didn't deal with the South China uh, the Sea issue uh, uh, in, in the book. Uh, I'm not uh, criticizing uh, the policies uh, of the United States, uh, of the United States government. Uh, the it is it it was certainly my observation that in the period after the beginning of the uh, economic crisis, uh, Chinese policies towards Japan, <coughs> South Asia, other countries, uh, became uh, uh, more insistent and, uh, and more assertive. The recent Chinese statements have been uh, in a uh, more uh, moderate direction. And uh, I think that's the constructive way in which things ought to evolve. I'm going to get to these questions in one second. These are questions from the audience, but that, that raises, you, you have a great analysis of the Dai Bing Guo December 2010 article, which really tried to put a lot of this view of China's becoming more aggressive, put that to rest. And, you know, Dai Binghua argues, and you correctly quoted, that China need, will transcend the traditional ways for great powers to emerge. I guess my question then, and then we'll get to these questions, is you think China is succeeding in doing this? And the second part of that question is, will the United States allow China to do that? For one of the big challenges before American foreign policy right now <laughs> is to develop a concept of dealing with China over a period of decades. Uh, and it therefore cannot be measured in biannual uh, 
intervals. The reason why that is so important is uh, because it is for the first time in our history that we will have to deal with a country of commensurable consequence uh, over an extended period of, uh, of time. And the same problem exists for China because both of us have been able to conduct our vision of ourselves uh, as in the sense of uh, it, it, without uh, having to be concerned about being challenged by a comparable power. So that is one problem. Secondly, the nature of international politics is changing in an unprecedented way. There are now, now a whole series of issues uh, nuclear proliferation, environment, uh, energy, uh, cyberspace, that can only be dealt with on a global basis, and they do not permit a definition of regional preeminence uh, as used to be uh, the case in, uh, in a traditional period. Third, uh, the consequences of a permanent conflict between the United States and China would impinge on the domestic structure of countries all over uh, the world and force regions of the world into choices which would constrain their uh, ability to deal with their already uh, already huge problems. So for all of these reasons, uh, I believe it would be desirable for the traditional pattern of international relations to be transcended. Uh, it, it would have to be transcended by both countries. It cannot be done by one country uh, unilaterally, and therefore your question, will can one country prevent another country from, oh, yes, from doing so? Yes, uh, it, it can happen. And I sketched uh, in the book what the strategies of each side would be if they did not come to an understanding. And I didn't say that I am hopeful that this goal will be achieved. I'm say, I am saying that both countries need to think through where they are going over a historic period of time in the nature of the interaction as we've seen in Southeast Asia uh, and, uh, and elsewhere, uh, the nature of the interaction, the two societies being both global economic powers are bound to impinge on each other. Uh, in each country there are undoubtedly forces that are looking at the short-term confrontational aspect. And in both countries a narrower nationalism uh, is appealing in the short run. So therefore the leadership on both sides needs to transcend this. Uh, can they do it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but they need to address the issue and they need to find some common vision of the future if they're going to do that. That's the basic theme of what I'm trying to, uh, to, uh, to say. Uh, in many ways, I see the Chinese leadership as having a clearer vision of a common future than our leadership. And I'm always questioning, you know, so much of the work of the National Committee is trying to educate Americans about China. And there are times when you see the level of knowledge and it can be deeply troubling. So where is that leadership going to come from in our own country? In a lot of ways, when you sit with Dai Bing Wu or Hu Jintao or <laughs> Wen Jiabao, they have a fairly clear view of what the common interests are, the complementary interests between the U.S. They understand where the differences are, yet they have a vision of you know, a, a cooperative future, one which they desire, of course, because their problems at home are so severe. I see it sometimes less amongst our leadership. Uh, I, uh I think, first of all, 
the two countries have a different history and a different, uh, therefore, a different uh, culture. In the American national experience, almost every problem that was recognized as a problem has proved to be soluble in a relatively brief period of time through the mobilization of resources. So America tends to segment foreign policy into a series of episodes and tries to overwhelm each episode with uh, pragmatic uh, solutions. Uh, the Chinese approach is uh, almost the opposite. In the Chinese view, every problem is related to a whole host of other problems. No problem has a final solution that what we, one considers a solution is an admissions ticket to another set of problems. Uh, for Americans, uh, the uh, pragmatism is the road to, uh, to insight. For the Chinese, there is a concept that doesn't even have an uh, English word, uh, I think it's called shu, which means, which defines the confluence of all the factors that are relevant to the solution of a problem and the momentum they achieve through through their conflict. So this is a more encompassing uh, view. Uh, I would therefore think that in my experience, the Americans are better at developing pragmatic short-term solutions. The Chinese are better in developing a conceptual uh, uh, approach. And therefore, when a new problem arises, there is an initial period in which these cultural predispositions uh, create a hiatus that needs to be bridged. I promised I would take, I still have many more questions, but I promised I would take some uh, audience questions. Uh, what differences do you see in the strategies that the United States and Europe use to engage China in the political sphere, especially with regards to a productive human rights dialogue. How could the US and Europe complement their methods to be more productive? Well, the uh, fundamental debate uh, that uh, uh, underlies this question is uh, to what extent governmental action and pressure can uh, change human rights uh, attitudes. And the second part of that question is uh, to what extent it's an alleviation of human rights practices uh, uh, aided by uh, a relationship of trust between the two governments, and to what extent is it fostered by visible pressure? That's the debate between engagement and, uh, and confrontation. And that's a debate uh, I'm, on the whole, on the side of engagement, though I respect and I've always the motivation uh, of the people who uh, assured uh, the other uh, uh, the other approach the uh, European approach I assume because their their officials are more assertive in human rights uh, proclamations when they are in China. Uh, I, I think there is a level in which the importance China attaches to good relations with countries will affect human rights uh, 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 pressures. I, I don't think that the, uh, the European approach is heavily influenced by its own domestic politics, as to some extent is uh, uh, 
is uh, uh, the American approach. Uh, and of course, no American president can ignore, or no democratic leader can ignore the human rights aspirations of its population. And, and none, no, Euro, no Western co country can fail to express its view in some manner, nor can that view be contained by, uh, by national borders. So the issue really comes down to how many overt pressures and sanctions are appropriate, and this is where opinions divide along the lines that I have indicated. Mm -hmm. Another audience question. What was your reaction when in the midst of your secret negotiations with Beijing, the Chinese invited the American ping pong team to visit China? Well, we nearly had a heart attack because, <laughs> because we, uh, we were engaged in exchanges with, uh, with China uh, that uh, uh, there was no experience in these exchanges with China, so they were done by messenger. Uh, so it was almost like the old period. It took about seven days for a message uh, to go back and forth. So in the middle of all of this, the Chinese invited the uh, ping pong team to Beijing. I think in part to put us on notice that if the secret approach didn't work, they could try, uh, they would try the, uh, uh, the public approach, but they didn't understand our problem, which was that almost nobody in our government knew about the secret approaches. So <laughs> we were faced with people popping off all over the place with their own interpretation. Uh, of, uh, of of what this meant, and uh, we, it finally got back into uh, a secret channel, but uh, the Chinese certainly uh, gave us some uh, worrisome night. Here's, I think, a very easy one. Not about what the Chinese were going to do, us. but. Uh, what comments might emerge here from people who had no idea of what we were doing? Here, here's an easy one, I think. Brent Scowcroft said, U.S. foreign policy on China is the most successful U.S. foreign policy in the last 40 years. Do you agree with that? <laughs> Since you were the engineer of it, I think the answer is going to be. Well, he, uh, he was uh, security advisor. No, the success of the American foreign policy is not what I may have done in Beijing on the first visit. The success of the American foreign policy is that through aid administration of both political parties, essentially the same principles that were established on the first visits, uh, and then to the enormous credit of the Democratic Party that followed us, were adopted uh, by uh, the Carter administration and with Brzezinski as a negotiator. And ever since then, even though in, within the United States there have been uh, swings between the parties, uh, the main lines of American foreign policy have been constant. And in that sense, it's the most nonpartisan foreign policy uh, that we have, and the core group of people of both parties uh, that have been concerned, of which the National Committee is a very important representative, uh, has sustained, uh, has sustained that policy. So in that sense, I agree with Skokro. You discuss Deng Xiaoping's strategy of keeping the Soviet Union from encircling China. On uh, this very specific, on page 374 and 375 of your book. <laughs> Does China have the same view of the United States today, hostily encircling China? No. My, uh, 
basic purpose in discussing these strategies is to explain the conceptual approach of China, of, of China through its history to inter international affairs. Uh, the Western strategic concept is, uh, and I illustrated by the games of chess and the games of Go. The game of chess has a fixed number of pieces on the board when it starts. And the purpose of the game is total victory. Uh, there is a draw conceivable, but the purpose of the game is total victory and it is achieved by the progressive uh, elimination uh, uh, of opposing pieces until the opposing king is checkmated, which means capable of uh, total destruction. The game of Go has, I think, 164 pieces, and there's no piece on the board when you start. And you put the pieces on the board progressively as you proceed so that any Go player has to consider not only what the situation is uh, on the board, but uh, what the opponent can do with the maybe 150 pieces he's got left if it's in the uh, early stages uh, of, of the game. And the purpose of the game is to encircle uh, your, uh, your adversary. And therefore, China has been extremely sensitive to what it perceives as encirclement uh, uh, policies. Uh, that's how, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, I, for example, as I began to study the Korean War from the point of view of why did China do it, uh, its major objective was not just the local situation in Korea, but to put together the appearance of the American Seventh Fleet in the Taiwan Strait, uh, plus uh, Korea, plus what might happen in Vietnam. Then the same situation again arose in 1979 uh, with, uh, with respect uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to Vietnam, and given these different approaches, uh, the American view of strategy has been, on the whole, uh, that the enemy in a war had, been had to be destroyed. It is to attack the physical capability of the enemy. The Chinese approach in war, which one can see, uh, is to affect the calculations of the adversary, and that therefore uh, it is the Chinese military actions in the communist period have been short, sharp military reactions very quickly followed uh, by, uh, 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 by, by negotiations. So yes, I think that in, in, in so far as the Chinese analyze Western actions or anybody's actions, Japanese actions, they do it in terms of, uh, of why key principles. And that doesn't mean I'd say their approach is better or worse, uh, but we should reflect about the following as a country. We've been engaged in four or five wars since uh, at the end of World War II. We always ended them with almost universal enthusiasm, and we've had great difficulty ending them. Uh, the Chinese have conducted short, sharp, short action and ended them very quickly. Uh, so that shows a, uh, a, uh, a, a different approach uh, uh, to strategy and may illustrate the problem of trying to fight wars to, for huge aims in a democratic society that has a limited patience with, uh, with, uh, with extended operations. But uh, I think one has, to under one has to analyze Chinese perceptions in these terms 
That doesn't mean we have to agree with them. But the beginning of wisdom is to understand it. What do you make of President Obama's meeting with the Dalai Lama this weekend? Do you think the transition of leadership in the Tibetan government in exile will impact the solution of Tibet-related issues? Look, the reality of the Tibetan uh, of meetings of the president with the Dalai Lama is that the uh, president feels obliged in the <laughs> domestic uh, circumstances that he faces uh, to to have those meetings. Uh, as he has that meeting, he is aware of the extremely adverse consequences it has inside China, which considers Tibet an integral part of Chinese territory. Uh, it is one of the uh, painful decisions presidents uh, have to make. And considering the uh, situation in which he finds himself, uh, he handled it as tactfully as I believe it was possible to do. The end of the book, you talk about, you have this concept of the Pacific community kind of, you, you talk about NATO, you know, the history of NATO, and then you talk about, you use that to flow into this discussion of the Pacific community, which I think is a, is a concept yeah. which maybe can provide us with a way to deal with China on a regular basis. What specific steps should we be taking to achieve that goal? Well, let me say, first of all, that if you don't like the specific steps that I'm outlining, that doesn't mean that the goal isn't valid. Because uh, I'm talking about the beginning of a, of a process, uh, and I'm not saying that I have all the answers to this process. What concerns me is that too much of Chinese-American relations is concentrating on solving issues that arise out of complexities or crises. And we've gotten actually pretty good at crisis uh, management. But we have not developed a common defined purpose. There has been discussion of the need for a purpose uh, and so the word community really means there must be some common things that first America and China do together, and concurrently all the countries of the region do together. If China and America think of themselves as co-evolutionists or as some sort of partners, then it is possible to look at issues without analyzing it in strictly speaking, in terms of the strategic balance. If other countries participate, then uh, it is possible for both China and America to have relations with the rest of Asia. Uh, what we need to avoid is that China is obs becomes obsessed with American with what they view as American efforts at military containment. And that America uh, becomes obsessed with being expelled from Asia and therefore fighting uh, for a, uh, 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 therefore every problem becomes uh, transmuted into a strategic issue. Now, I say specifically, I don't know whether it is possible uh, to achieve this. But because the world is so different uh, than it has been historically, uh, it must be attempted. I spent most of my uh, education in, uh, in international affairs on issues dealing with the balance of power. Uh, I 
conducted foreign policy in the Cold War period that was entirely uh, or largely based on uh, the balance of power. So I understand this, this world. I believe, uh, I use the example of World War I. I cite a British document from the year 1907 that explains why conflict between uh, Germany and Britain is inevitable. No matter what leaders say at any one point, because the uh, imperatives in the security field of each side will drive them into confrontation. And then I ask this question, if the leaders that followed these precepts had known what the world would look like in 1919 after the war, would they have done it? Or would they not have tried to find some solution that avoided uh, what turned into an absolute catastrophe uh, for Europe, from which Europe had never recovered. So I'm asking if we decide on both sides, and it emphatically has to be done on both sides, that uh, we, of course, will have differences, uh, but whether we can avoid sliding from these differences into a kind of strategic confrontation. And uh, uh, what are the positive goals that can be set for, uh, for such an enterprise? Uh, when I was in Beijing, I met with one group uh, uh, that is actually studying this question. That doesn't mean they will do it. Uh, and. Uh, and I'm going to try to create a similar group here uh, to, uh, to study that question and have some uh, meetings uh, between these groups. But of course, it has to be supported uh, uh, by governments. And I don't think this is very far from what uh, the US government and the Chinese government can conceivably do. So this is the... Uh, idea, but I'm not saying it is guaranteed, and all the experts of my previous wisdom will prove that it isn't possible. Given, I think, that the, intra the, the, the risks that each society faces are basically complementary that if you think about what really are the problems confronting the United States, terrorism, global warming, right. economic disaster, that those are the same problems that are confronting China. And that only if we're approaching them through your concept, you know, one where we can avoid these strategic disagreements, are we going to be able to deal with them? Absent that, I think we're almost dooming ourselves to failure in dealing with those issues. Well, I noticed a, a high Indonesian official said a few weeks ago, uh, "We don't want you to leave Asia, and we don't make you. Uh, we don't want you to make us choose uh, between uh, China and yourself." And this is exactly the problem that needs to. Uh, uh, we, we won't leave Asia, but we don't want to do it as part of a strategic confrontation if we and China can find a way to cooperate in this. I think that's a perfect note on which to end today's program. You've given generously of your time. I just want to remind everyone that the book on China is for sale out back. And it is, a, it is a great read. It is a great, great read. And Dr. Kissinger, I can't thank you enough, number one, for your time today, number two, for being a, a vice chair of the National Committee, and for your contribution to U.S.-China relations over the last 40 years. And, and let me congratulate the National Committee for running this